hand so you don't take any hope germs home with you. But this flu spell will get, be over. Spring will be here and we'll be all set. Just a very few announcements. Because some people don't have internet capabilities at home, there is no fellowship time following worship this morning. But when you go downstairs, there are still some study books available for Lenten study that will begin next week on Wednesday. So um, sign up and take a book. So shoot down the fellowship hall and get one of those. There is no pancake supper on Tuesday, but it will be rescheduled at another special time. So we're doing everything that we can to stop the workings of the flu here at, at Hope Church. Wednesday evening, we still will have an Ash Wednesday service. The service will be changed a little bit in this format, but please come to Ash Wednesday as we begin our Lenten se season together for the service at 7 o'clock. Tomorrow evenings, tomorrow mornings, quilt ministry time has been canceled. So... The sewing needles, if they've got germs, they're going to just sit there for another, another month. And I do believe I've covered all the announcements. Yes, Mary Ellen. The preschool class is in now the newest choir, and um, they had a special number planned. They need help because with the flu, some people have stayed home, and we only have one preschooler here with us this morning. So when it comes time for that number, there are the beginnings of four verses of this little light of mine in your bulletin. So congregation, we need you to sing, and some of our elementary kids are going to come up, and they're going to help our one preschooler here as they go through the motions. And uh, there is no dance rehearsal, correct? Is there a dance rehearsal this morning? Okay. Oh, you were. Okay. All right. All right. Any other announcements that should be made? If not, can we prepare ourselves for worship? Hope's family is God's family. We can feel God's presence with us. We'll be guided by the Holy Spirit as we worship together.
Let's join in our call to worship. The world is changing rapidly before us. Our ways of understanding have been challenged and stretched. What we once knew has passed away, and we do not know what lies before us. May we move forward as the body of Christ, assured of God's presence. May we embrace the future with hope. May we know God's love endures forever. Our first hymn is in the black hymnal number 2103. We have come at Christ's own bidding. in our opening prayer. God of dazzling beauty, yours is the radiance that transfigured Christ Jesus. We pray today for a glimpse of your glory. Within this house of praise, within this congregation, within our prayers and music, within our speaking and listening, may the radiance of Christ shine in our minds and hearts once more. Because your love is all-inclusive, because your wisdom can bring beauty out of chaos, we bring our worship to you. We pray for one another, gathered in this fellowship here today, encourage each according to their need, equip each according to the challenges of the season and the things that are needed, and bless each with that grace which knows no bounds and transfigures all things. Receive our compassion. 
Through Christ Jesus our Lord, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Please join as we recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Children's time. Would the children please come up? Good morning. Come on and have a seat up here. We're going to read the scripture this morning. And then I have a little job for you to do before you sing for us. Where's Ava? Are you coming up? There we go. No, you don't have to sing. That's fine. So this morning, we have what's called a special holiday that's called Transfiguration. Did you ever hear that word? Transfiguration. You're going to hear a lot about it as we go along in worship. It feels painful, but it, it might have been a little painful for the disciples it remembers the time when the disciples and Jesus were together on the mountain, and all of a sudden, Jesus' clothes became bright, really, really bright white. It probably hurt their eyes. That's why I said it really might have been painful. And they got to see God's glory shining in Jesus. Jesus didn't change or anything like that, but he became bright, bright, bright with God's glory. And I think, really, when we sing this little light of mine, in a sense, that's what we're singing about, that God's glory can shine in all of us. So the scripture, not the one that Paul's going to read. By the way, thank you, Paul. Paul is not Debbie. I know it says Debbie Ewing in the book, or in your book bulletin, but Debbie is homesick, yes. With a lot of people have been sick, sick, sick. So who likes to read? Does anybody like to read? All right, we're going we're gonna to let you read one verse each then. All right, do you want to read one? Okay, we're going to start, let's see, 2 Corinthians 4, and I think it's 3 to 6, yeah? All right, so if you hold it, I'm going to point to it, and I'm going to hold the microphone for you. Verse 3, which is right, there's 2, where's the 3? There's the 3. So you read 3, 4, you want to read one? 5, do you want to read one? No? Okay, then I'll read 6. And... And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in the... In their case, the God of this world has blinded all the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, Christ who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as you s- s- slaves for, for Jesus' sake. And then the last verse says this, for it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So you this week get to be the light. And after the singing time today, I would like you to help me by passing something around in the congregation. Now we're being really, really careful not to touch anything and pass germs today. So we're going to be careful. We're going to hold the little boxes that I have and let people just take one out. You're going to pass a candle around to everybody so that they can all and all of us can remember that we are lights for God. 
And the candles that you guys will get to take home are the kind where the light doesn't go out. Okay? All right. I can't wait to hear you sing and watch you. Everybody got your singing ready? Okay, here we go. Hey, for the rest of the kids. <laughs> we got our helpers coming. sing our next hymn while my helpers come back and pass out the candles. Yep. Sorry. Our hymn is found in your hymnal number 258.
Our Old Testament reading this morning uh, can be found in the Pew Bible, page 328, and this is from 2 Kings 2, verses 1 to 14. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land, dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet... If you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Our New Testament reading. Please stand. This will be uh, page 919, and it's from Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Of course, it's a different page up here. There we go. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
Do you know that we serve a really cool God? Yeah. I think it's pretty awesome when God does things in our lives. Maybe that we don't even always expect. Um, most of you know I've been sick this week, and so we've been trying to figure out how to handle church today and whether the sermon was going to happen. And yesterday, as I was plugging along, I thought, well, I know somebody I could call. I bet I could call Julie Bueller. She'd hang in there. And, but I really hate to ask Julie because she's such a busy person, and I'm sitting there typing away. And this message comes across, and I had an email from Julie Bueller saying, if you need help, I'm here to help. So I thought, okay, God, well, that's a pretty sure sign that we should adjust some things a little bit. So Julie and I are going to do the sermon together today. Um, She has the full copy of the script in case I start coughing too much. But I think we're going to be fine, and in between I can get a quick drink of water. But I'm really excited to share with you, I've had such a wonderful opportunity this week to just sit and ponder the transfiguration. So let's ponder together. Today we remember and celebrate as we cross the threshold from Epiphany to Lent. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this amazing event, the day that the divinity and the humanity of Jesus was so clearly displayed to all around him. We read in Mark's Gospel, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them high on the mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. Transfiguration is such an interesting word. I'm not even sure if any of us could really define it. I spent a lot of time this week studying it and reading what people have taught about it. Um, There was Jesus standing, and suddenly he was dazzlingly clothed in white, much as Paul's words in the Corinthian reading that the children did, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ was in Jesus, who is the image of God. In those moments and in Paul's words, that light God shining in Christ. Can you imagine shining in Christ? Divinity shining in the body of humanity became so apparent, truly signaling God crossing the threshold to earth and Jesus crossing the threshold from ministry to preparing for his crucifixion. But that wasn't all because Mark wrote, there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, And they were talking with Jesus. Hundreds of years later, Moses and Elijah appeared on the scene. The law and the prophets come to that place. The presence of Moses and Elijah certainly demonstrate that Jesus was not just some fly-by-night rabbi who was coming in for a short time and would be gone, but he had been part of the plan all the way along. And then... As if the assurance and conviction of that wasn't enough, the voice of God speaks. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. That line, the one we talked about a few weeks ago, at the baptism of Jesus, again confirms and reveals who Jesus is. But please note, this is nothing new. Nothing has been changed about Jesus. He himself isn't changed in front of them. He doesn't become something different. No, he is transfigured. He is revealed. He is shown to be who he truly is. His appearance was starkly and strongly revealed, but not changed. He was transfigured, not transformed. Sometimes I think we get transfiguration and transformation a little confused and entangled maybe. I was doing that a little bit, even in my own thoughts this week. In between my times of reading and stretching, I'd get up out of my lounge chair and, or recliner and walk the house, you know, through the living room and dining room and walk up and down the stairs, trying to keep the air flowing in my lungs, all that good stuff. I'd get up and I'd walk and I'd be thinking, but I'd also be looking out the windows. And it was so cool because, you know, it was beautiful outside this week. The snow was bright, dazzling white. And the ice, when the ice came, even though it was scary, was sparkling in the sunshine. 
And so sometimes I'd stand there and I'd look out the window for a minute or two or three or even four, and the coolest thing would happen. All of a sudden, I'd notice not just the snow or the ice, I'd notice a bird flitting from the tree to the feeder, or other ones flying around in the woods behind, and I'd see flashes of red and, and bright some, some shades of blue and, and wings flapping. Everything would come alive. The colors of those wings and those feathers stood out in such stark and gorgeous contrast to the bright white that was there. The whole scene was transfigured. It didn't change. It just came alive. And what was revealed was splendor, if I just patiently watched. Transfiguration and transformation are different words. They're different concepts. In transformation, things change. There is remaking of the nature of a person or an object. Transfiguration, though, is a revelation, a showing of a true nature. Here Jesus stands revealed. It is as if a mask is taken away from his face. The disciples are granted a vision of who he really is. In Jesus, as in no other, God was revealed and God spoke. If we want to know what God is like, Mark is saying we should look at Jesus Christ. We should listen to Jesus Christ. Jesus is not transformed on the mount that day. He doesn't go up to the mountain like a caterpillar and wrap up in a cocoon and emerge as a glorious butterfly. That may be what happens at the resurrection event, but not here. But transformation is a part of the scripture today. Jesus was transfigured. But I think if we think about it, we could say that the disciples were transformed. In watching Jesus, in encountering God incarnate in Christ, their lives were changed. They were no longer fishermen and tax collectors. They were disciples of Christ, following him along the paths of ministry. And then as they returned down from the mountain, they joined Jesus with the work that he had come to do. Peter and James and John could no longer see Jesus as they had seen him before. What they had witnessed on that mountaintop, although they were told to be quiet for a while, they could not dismiss it or leave it behind. In our lives, we could think of lots of examples of transformations, couldn't we? There's some great examples of transformative experience in the movies. Many of them ones we know very well. Think of Scrooge, whose life was transformed after he encounters with the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. Think of the Grinch, who, well, in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day, and then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. Perhaps transformations are often brought about because of transfiguration-type experiences. A little light shone in Scrooge's world, and in the Grinch's as well, and it changed who they were. And for your Harry Potter fans, um, even Dumbledore uh, reminds us that it, as students, as he stood in a scene surrounded by oh so many candles, that happiness can be found even in the darkest of times, if only one remembers to turn on the light. Those are all fictitious, of course, but how often do we witness amazing transformations? Where is it that the light is turned on? Where does the illuminating presence of God shine through? Where does the transfiguration light be? Perhaps even bringing about transformation. I read story after story this week about transformations. One story was particularly powerful to me, and it happened not that long ago, in the late 1980s. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound that long ago to me. It was in communist Romania, and the story was told of a young man named Dan Gavra. 
Gavra had become a Christian during that dark time in Romania's history when Nicholas, Nicholas Ceausescu was the dictator. Although the Berlin Wall had fallen, a lot of people in Romania really didn't even know what was happening in the outside world. The pastor in Garver's town began speaking out against Ceausescu and against communism, and his church grew and grew. The government attempted to, be, to throw him out, to keep him quiet, but the community arose around him to support him and stand up against what was happening politically in their town and in their country, and to stand for the freedom to worship Christ. This is in the 1980s, folks. One dark night, as the people stood, Gavra gathered some change from the people. And he went out and he bought candles from a nearby church, from the Orthodox Church. And after distributing the candles, he lit the first one, and the others followed. Amidst chants and songs, they proclaimed their freedom and their belief in God. Sadly, there was a revolt from the military. But that one candle began the lighting of the flame of light that would topple the dictator. The light of Christ that had been reflected through that pastor and through that church community was upheld in a candle lit by Gavra, and was spread by the candles and the voices and the people all around. Transfiguration of the bright lights and transformation hand in hand. And of course, how could I not mention what perhaps you have been watching as well as I have on the television these last couple days? The witness in South Korea as the athletes have gathered now, I don't know about you, but watching a young adult from North Korea and a young adult from South Korea carry a flag in together of a team of athletes, young adults, saying, we are one unity, is a very powerful statement. And then watching two hockey team members, a North and a South Korean, take the flame and carry it up to where a light would be lit that the whole world is going to watch for these next two weeks. Did you hear that, my friends? A light was lit by athletes together that are now sharing that time together on a team. Five young people, children, re-entered the stadium a little bit later. They too were carrying lights, not quite as small as our candles, but they were symbolic. We were told in the commentaries that were kind of endless the other night, but very interesting too. They were symbolic of the two million candles lit on the streets of South Korea in 2016, leading to political transformation. And then the doves of peace flew, the candles and the drones burned, and the commentators for the evening almost prayed out the hope that these could be the beginnings of more permanent and positive developments for that region. The dancers and the singers and the athletes that brought so much light and so much hope and so much beauty and promise. And one speaker even reminded those listening of the possibility of listening for the footsteps of God. I don't know if you heard that statement. It was way at the end of the, the whole night. Listen to the footsteps of God and to grab on to the hem of his coat, knowing that the energy of the times can often carry us to a solution that almost seems impossible. The unimaginable happened on the mount, that mountain when Jesus was transfigured. Peter, James, and John saw the light of God as never before. Their world and the world around them was forever changed. A, an Episcopal hospital chaplain in Kansas City offers us a glimpse of being both those transfigured and those called to transform. As he said, we are called to reflect the presence of Christ within us. And we're called to do that, 
not by becoming someone or something that we are not already, but by allowing the light of Christ that shines on in us to reflect from us out into a dark and weary world, just as our kids sung today. Throughout this Lent and through every day of our lives in Christ, let us pursue our own transfiguration. And in time, the world will see us, literally, in a new light. For the same light that showed the glory of Christ on the mountain will show the glory of Christ in our lives and the promise of the glory of Christ for the whole world. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue on with our time of prayer. George is going to bring the microphone around. He'll hold it. We won't pass it. But he'll bring it around for um, the, the sharing of the con- celebrations and the concerns. We'll do them all together at one time. And then Julie and I will lead in a time of prayer. You have a response printed in your bulletin. We will prompt it by saying, give thanks to God who is always good. And you will say his love, whose love endures forever. I want to let you know that for the next few weeks, our prayer time is going to look quite different, Um, and you will be invited to write your prayer concerns down, and we'll talk more about that in the weeks ahead, but we wanted to make sure that this week we had time to verbally share our prayer concerns before God, our celebrations, and our concerns today. George? Oh, oh. I'm sorry. Yes, um, God, please watch over all our homebound and everyone in the world, and thank you for your beautiful love. That's all. Other words of sharing of our celebrations and our concerns. Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for working with our kids, Mary Ellen, and um, for bringing that light of Christ in their lives and their voices. You're quite welcome. Well, we have a celebration in our household. Orrin and I will be married 32 years on Wednesday. Thanks be to God. Congratulations. Jack. My sister, Barbara, uh, 96, had a stroke yesterday, and she's in Bay State uh, Intensive Care. Uh, There's quite a bit of hope for the recovery, Uh, but please um, join me in prayers for her. Also, we want to pray for people in our world who are suffering from hunger, from natural disasters, from prejudice, from warfare. We pray for peace with justice. Jack, tell us again your sister's name. Barbara. Barbara. Pray for Barbara this week. Thank you. As George is walking over there, you probably are seeing that we're a little slimmer here in church this morning. Um, We have a lot of A lot of people sick, my friends. Um, And a number just came down through the week. It was like boom, 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 boom. Flu, upper respiratory, stomach bugs, pneumonia. Um, So please do your best to stay healthy. Seriously, take George's word seriously. Use that hand sanitizer as you leave again today. Um, And and take good care. If, If you need anything this week, know that this is your family This is the body of Christ, and people are ready to help and to serve. So, yes. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their prayers for my brother. The mass came back non-cancerous. Amen. Thank you. Thanks be to God. George has oh, sorry to make you work, George. <laughs> um, I, I wish to uh, thank the congregation for all their support for Joanna. She is doing very well. I was distracted and didn't mention this last week. Um, and uh, forgive me for any uh, um, 
overreaching of my authority. Thank you. <laughs> Which is what? <laughs> We're really trying hard not to pass things. Sorry. <laughs> Any other prayers or celebrations? I have a celebration and a yes. concern. Yes, George. We finally heard from Daniel. And he has been moved to a holding spot until the determination as to the amount of his disability. And then he will be discharged and return home. But this process could take three months. And when I talked to him last Sunday, I found there's very little to do. He said, Grandpa, I get up, I go to eat, I go to therapy, I take a nap, I go to eat, and I take a nap. There's very, very little to do. So he would love to hear from everybody here in the congregation. And I have addresses here. So see me after church. He would love to be bombarded with a lot of notes and cards from his church family. Thank you, George. I also want to share with you that two of our congregation members have um, parents who are very ill right now. We're keeping Dawn in our prayers this week as she has gone out to be with her dad. And Julie told me this morning that Susan's mother, yes, yeah, there you are. Susan's mother, our choir director's mother, is passing. And so um, please keep these families in your prayers as they stand beside those that they love and hold their hands until God's hands surround them. Let us be in the spirit of prayer as we remember all of these people today. We thank you, God of light, for all that shines on our path, revealing beauty around us and yet a greater beauty ahead of us. For the light that displays the sheen on a beautiful bird at a feeder, the eagerness in a pet's eyes, and the white snow shining in the sun, let us give thanks to God who is always good, whose love, love endures forever. For the light that reveals the perfection of a baby's hands, the pink cheeks of a running child, the white teeth in a stranger's smile, the silver in a grandmother's hair, the affectionate glance of a friend, the forgiveness in the eyes of a loved one, the infectious grin of a teenage Christian. Give thanks to God, who is always good, whose love endures forever. For the light that enhances our worship, O oh God, the beauty in polished wood and new carpet, the artistry in altar displays, the gentle flickering of a candle, the letters of the page on the pages of the Bible and the hymnal, we give thanks to the God who is always good, whose love, love endures, endures forever. Best of all, we thank you for that inner light which flows from the Holy Spirit of God and transfigures all things. The light that flashes from the scriptures and erupts gloriously from the words and deeds of Jesus. The inner light that strikes us in a moment of near despair. The light that guides us one step at a time. The light that gives our life direction and purpose. And the light that persists even in the valley of the shadow of death. Give thanks to God who is always good. Whose, whose love, love endures, endures forever. We thank you, God of light, for all that shines on our way, revealing beauty around us and a yet greater beauty ahead of us. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving today. Hear our prayers for all in need, for those who are ill, for those who struggle, for those who are standing beside those who are dying, for all who are lifted today. We pray all these things through Christ our Redeemer. Amen. So the next thing that we're going to change in worship this morning is we're not going to take the offering. Novel idea in church. Thank you, Julie. But um, we're going to invite you if you have an offering this morning. The plates are in the back. When you leave, you can leave them there. That would be fine. But again, we're not going to pass the plates from person to person. We're trying hard to keep you all well. So we're going to continue on. Remembering that transfiguring light of Christ and sing together from our black hymnals, uh, the face we sing, number 2173, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
before the passion of your beloved Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that as we behold the light of his face, we may be strengthened to bear the cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. We may not be able to stay on the mountaintop, but the mountaintop of the presence of God can stay with us. Take your candle this week and maybe light it, maybe watch it, but remember that glory of Christ that shone and shines in you. And go forth knowing that God is with you and even is in you. Amen. Amen. Amen.